back in 1971, a lady named Judith Jarvis Thompson published her now famous, some might say infamous, essay, A Defence of Abortion. Now this uh, essay is the most, probably the most well known, it's definitely the most widely reprinted, uh, or last time I checked it was, philosophy essay, and some suggest that it could possibly even be one of the most widely read uh, philosophy articles ever. So this is quite a, this thing permeates, if you've been to university, it's not just something that turns up in philosophy, it turns up in all sorts of classes and departments. So it's a, a, one particular part of it we're going to talk about, and that's called the violinist analogy. In her essay, Juve, uh, Jarvis Thompson basically tries to mount a case for abortion in which she says the status of the fetus is irrelevant. She even states that she believes her argument could provide justification for abortion even if the fetus is a human person. Now she doesn't believe that, but she says even if it was, she thinks her argument's a sound enough one to accept, uh, to justify abortion. Despite the popularity of your essay, or more, more particularly, I think it's commonly quoted violinist analogy, which we're going to look at in just a second, I don't think that Jarvis Thompson's essay is actually a very solid case for abortion. In fact, I would suggest that it is a rather weak defence once you begin to scrutinise the logic that she's trying to employ in the situation, which is something I want to do now. So let's have a look at the violinist analogy, and I'm sure you've probably, many of you have heard this before. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist. A famous unconscious violinist. <laughs> he has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months. By then, he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. I guess you can see where she's going with this analogy when she mentions nine months. Basically, what Jarvis Thompson goes on to do is suggest that this analogy here is akin to being pregnant, and therefore the violinist has no right to be plugged into you. And, and basically she would say, well, in that same way, a fetus doesn't have a right to be plugged into your womb either, and it's okay to be rid of the fetus from your womb. Now, so what are the flaws in Judith Jarvis Thompson's thinking? Because I think this uh, analogy has some problems. Um, well, the, one of the first flaws is really, I think it's kind of obvious, is that this situation is not consensual. I think it's kind of obvious to everyone that the Society of Music Lovers has kidnapped you. It's not really like a consensual night out with Mr. Wright, okay? Um, <laughs> even if he does happen to play the violin. Um, so. That's, that's not a, quite an obvious flaw, and some have obviously pointed it out, but I think there's other flaws too. First of all, I don't think this analogy actually does have a lot in common with pregnancy. Sure, it's nine months, and you're biologically, well, you're artificially, but you're connected to someone in a biological way providing sustenance. But there's much more to pregnancy than just that. First of all, the violinist is an unjust aggressor in this scenario. But the unborn human being in their fetal stage of development is an innocent. They have no malice or bad intent towards the mother. Second floor, I think, is that obviously the violinist is a cold and absolute stranger. But pregnancy confers a very special bond between the woman and the unborn human being. And that is the bond of maternity, the maternal bond, the bond of motherhood. The relationship between the woman and the unborn human being is maternal. But there is no relationship between the violinist and his human captive. No matter how long you remain plugged into the violinist, he will never become your brother, he will never become your father or your son. The, there is a complete distinction between the relationship of the two. Conception confers maternity. And maternity, I believe, comes with certain expectations of the way the son or the daughter who is conceived should be treated and the responsibilities that go along with that. The next flaw is there is no common intention between these two scenarios. If we are to unplug ourselves from the violinist, we intend to be free of our attachment to the violinist, which obviously is an act of unjust aggression. But with abortion, the intention is quite different. The intention is to end the life of the fetus, and then it is expelled from the womb. The violinist analogy confuses, I think, direct death with a direct killing with an indirect death. If I unplug myself from the violinist, yes, the violinist will die. But their death is not something that I have intended, necessarily, or directly caused, in fact. Their ailment, this is the key bit, their ailment is what kills them. They will die if I unplug myself 
but their death is indirect as a result of that unplugging. It is not, it's not like I turned around and stabbed them, then uh, extracted myself from them, which would be a direct form of death. And, and the, this is not the scenario with abortion. The, 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 the abortion death is a direct death. Another common sort of variation you might hear of this particular argument that's coming a bit more common now is what's called the organ donor argument. Some of, uh, I was in a discussion with someone recently, they said to me, oh, sure, um, you know, do you talk about bodily autonomy and, and all the rest of it? But the simple fact is that let's say you were sick and you needed someone's organs and they were the perfect match for you. You have no right to demand that they give you your organs. You, ca you can't force them to give you their organs to save your life. And just the same way, a fetus can't demand that the organs, the, don uh, the, the body of the mother be donated to it for a short period in order to, to, to save its life. But once again, the organ donation analogy is, is there's quite a big distinction there between direct and indirect death. And it is, they're right, it is ethically perfectly sound for you to say, no, I refuse to give, to donate my organs. There's nothing unethical about that. But what kills the person is not you. What kills the person is the ailment. It's a very important distinction. I think what all of this does is, in effect, Jarvis Thompson asks us to ask the wrong question, and then she completely ignores the key question, I think, in all of this. The, the question that she wants us to ask is this one here. Does the unborn human being in the fetal stage of development have the right to occupy the womb? And from... And the answer to that question is, I would contend to you, is no, it doesn't have the right to be. There's no such thing as a human right to be in a womb. Go to your womb. There's no such thing as a human right to be in a womb, okay? <laughs> but what Jarvis Thompson wrongly then assumes from that position is that means, well, we can do whatever we want to to it. And I would argue that second point is not so. It does not follow. It does not follow at all. I don't think the correct question is actually being asked. And I think we need to be asking, and this leads me to where all this build up is to the second question here, and that is this. This, I think, is the correct question. Do we have the right to terminate and expel the fetus from the womb? And that is a different proposition altogether.